Well, good day, all. I wrap Steve with your financial market wrap up, and this wrap up is for the evening. And we're now on Tuesday, and we're sitting here on the 5th of October, 2022. All right, my friends, stick it to them, stick it to them. It's like a song, right? OPEC, stick it to them, stick it to them. Two million barrels. Who would have thought? I, I thought a week and a half ago, two or 300,000 barrel cut. I, I said it. Not going to hide it. That's what I thought. Nah. Then we started hearing this week 500,000 to a million barrels. Then we heard that Mr. Novak of Russia, their energy minister, oil minister, was going to come to OPEC. Well, that did it. You got a first meeting in OPEC in two years. All the delegates are coming. Stick it to them. Stick it to them. And that's what they did. They stuck it to them. They went for a two million barrel a day drop in production. However, not everything's what it seems. And the reason is they admit that many of the members have not for a very long time, I've laughed about it because it averages three to 3.5 million barrels a day that they haven't been producing. So for some of them, they're adjusting those numbers. When you take in the 2 million and you make the adjustments, you're closer to about 880,000 barrels a day. That is a real production cut. Now you've also got the same thing happening that uh, Mr. Novak of Russia said that if the European Union puts on price caps, any country that joins it will not get Russian oil. Put on the price caps. Get your oil elsewhere. You can't have this bully telling you what you're going to run your economy. I mean... He's already telling you what he's going to do with the nuclear weapon. The world has to stand up and eliminate these guys. I'm not calling for his death. I'm calling for him to be dethroned. I'm not calling for him not to be president. There's a difference. A president without the world powers that he thinks he's had is a different person. I would never call for anything beyond that. That's what I think is going to happen. I think that uh, sooner or later, Either his people turn on him or he has to go with some sort of big thing in Ukraine. All we keep reading in the press, and I never know how much of that is propaganda. I want to share that with you. I read a lot of newspapers from all over the world, though. Um, it seems as though the Russian army has been in a serious retreat. They'll regroup. There's plenty of them. They'll make some inroads. What those are, I don't know. But you're not just going to take an army of that size and say, I'm driving you back across that border. Do you think that's really going to happen? I'm not in that school of thought. I wish it would happen, but I don't think that's going to happen. So let's go back. What will make the Fed not raise interest rates? First thing, got an idea? This is coming out November 2nd. What would happen? The only thing in my mind that can happen to stop them would be a nuclear device, a tactical nuclear device in Ukraine that shakes the world and the Fed would go on hold. Barring that, to me, the question is 50, 75, or 100 basis points. So here we are back to the reality. The JOLTS report that just came out, was it yesterday, did nothing to, to weaken the jobs. So now we're going to look tomorrow very hard at unemployment claims. We were shocked to see them drop as much as they did last time. So now we'll see, can they come up? Next thing, when we want them to come up, remember, bad is good. It sounds crazy. More people getting on unemployment, the better it is. The Fed's job is happening. They're weakening the economy. The third thing is the Friday number. So then we get the jobs data. Now, what I don't like is the market started off on Bloomberg on Monday, because I write down the numbers as they tell you what they think, and it was 250,000 jobs. As of this morning, it suddenly changed. Now they're looking for job creation of 265. The higher, the worse. You don't want to see all these new jobs being created. And I know somebody will come out, well, it's not as much as last time. If it's growing, it's still not what the Fed wants. They want to see a big shrinkage in the growth. So that's what you look at. That would let the market trade through up until next Wednesday, because next Thursday is the CPI data. After that, you are set for whatever is going to happen come November. Got that out of the way. All right, let's look at the S&P. 
The market is up for the week, nearly 6%. It has certainly come rocking and rolling back to the upside. Let's not forget that. Of course, it broke big, so it's entitled to do that. You can see how the rally fueled itself here. Are we in a trend? We are not. We are in a market that ended a downtrend when it took out this whole slope and came back through everything just the past 72 hours. The market is stalled right where it should. What do I call the red line on this chart? It is the 18-day average of closes, but what do I call it? The line in the sand. You've heard me, if you've watched me for years here, talk about it. It is not uncommon that if a market breaks, it comes back and fights a battle there. It is not uncommon if the market stays over, it comes down and fights a battle there. We can go over and over on the charts. That is what often happens. And that's what you're doing right now. You're fighting your battle for the direction. The problem I have is even if it goes up from here, it, it still has the pattern of a lower, low, higher high. The only thing that would change that to the upside is dropping through. Today's low, reversing, getting through the highs of today, closing higher and over the 18-day average. Then I could be bullish. That's an awful lot. That's like saying, oh, they're going to do this, three different steps to that, the tango, whatever. I was never a good dancer. Can't do it. Then you get into where's the Bollinger Bands? We well, were running them, but they're not in play right now. This one's too far away. That one's too far away. I don't see anything that's in play there. Momentum-wise, we had been embedded. When you're embedded, the first thing that happens is to leave it, you become over what? Oversold. How do you correct an oversold market? Here you are with the embedded. Both the numbers just staying sideways, 20. You get a reading over 21, you've lost that reading. The odds favor you're going to go to the 18-day average of closes, just as I pointed out. And then you're working out of a market that, by design, it's still oversold. Any reading under 30, the way I teach charting, is still oversold. It's got to work its way out, and that's what the market is doing right now. So it's out of being oversold. It's not trending, and it's stuck at this average. It's not the only one. When we step over to the NASDAQ, it is the same story. Not a trend, lower, low, higher, high right there. When we come to the Dow, same identical thing. All three. The only one that isn't has been the Russell. The Russell is in an uptrend at this point, trying to make its way to the 100-day average. What's in play is not the Bollinger Band. I didn't say it can't be hit, but it's really not what's in play. It's between here and the 100-day average that I would look for the next resistance level. Now, if we take a look in this market, the high today, because this is Wednesday, the high was 1777.50. You haven't taken it out yet, so it's still the numbers right here, and that's what the market's doing. And again, not oversold anymore. When we step over to the VIX, what should the VIX have done? Well, if the stocks are going to rally, the VIX probably falls back to its line in the sand. I mean, it's a puzzle, but once you get it, you're able to start figuring out what's going on, and there's your support. So you had a correction within a bull market that ended back to the 18-day average, correcting an overbought condition that's no longer overbought. When you come to the bond market, where do you see the resistance? Tick tock, tick tock. If you don't see that it's the 18-day average of closes, you should not watch these videos. You're not grasping anything I'm saying. It's not uncommon that you're down here, you make a run, and you figure out from the 18-day average your next step. Are we in a downtrend? You are absolutely in a downtrend. The pros are probably priming themselves at 128 and a quarter going short, but at 129.12 over that, they'll probably say goodbye to short positions. Then you've changed the pattern to higher lows, higher highs. But that hasn't happened. I think they went short on that rally, and I think they're still short. Ten-year notes, identical. You rallied to the 18-day average. First time that you got there since mid-August. You do see that. But it holds up. It's the same thing. You've been in a downtrend. You got some relief out of it. You lost the embedded reading. Market became oversold. You corrected to that number, and you're still in the downtrend. The five-year notes, I promise you, look the same way. 
Then we get to the dollar index. So the dollar was on a tear to the upside, but you know what I teach you. You rarely get more than five days in a row over a Bollinger Band, and then you move to the right-hand side. And at the, in this particular case, you then also lost the embedded reading. So if you and I look at this, let me see if I can bring it together, because it, it's very important. You lose that embedded reading, and when you lose that reading, it means often, if you've taken my enhanced Bollinger Band course, this is where it occurred. This is losing the reading. The odds favor that you're going back to the 18-day average of closes. To me, that's worth a lot of money to know. Where would I be wrong in my analysis if you got back over this high? Another thing is it should not re-embed the next day. Barring that, though, on the close, at the minimum, it tells me run. Run to get out of everything that you are possibly long on. And bingo, and that's where you're at, okay? It's in my course. You can do this yourself. In the euro, you never did embed. So you've rallied back in a bear market up to the 18-day average. You turned into an uptrend under the 18-day average, and you're fighting for direction. I can argue that until you take out the load that I'm pointing to right here, that the market has got upside bias, and it's in an uptrend, and momentum is still up. I can make that argument. In the British pound, will the market make it to the Bollinger Band? I doubt it. I mean, every day is a new soap opera with Liz Truss and what is going on. Now, tomorrow, her exchequer is going to be meeting with the bankers. She's got to sell them on his program. But we're all left in limbo. We're not going to know how they're going to pay for all the programs that are coming about until November 23rd. And upon that date, it can get very crazy because what if everybody says, no, the plan won't work? This is why this is a nice relief rally, but it's a very difficult market anymore to want to be involved in. The, the chart action is overbought in an uptrend with upside bias with a risk if you get long back down to 105.38. No, nah, I wouldn't touch that market. In Bitcoin, the market is trying to be in an uptrend, but it's got immediate heavy resistance at the upper Bollinger Band, all right? You've narrowed in these bands, so it looks to me like you're going to go sideways. I think the market's waiting on the jobs data. You know, it ties itself in momentum as best as it can to whatever the stock markets are doing. When we get to Brent versus WTI, you have to ask yourself, how much of the news today had already been discounted to a degree? The market was looking for production cuts. We had heard that they were discussing 500,000 to a million barrels. I think the market was blown away by the 2 million number, but it didn't rally much on it. Why? Because immediately the, 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 the bright boys that do the analysis and brokerage firms around the world said, that's not 2 million, guys. Read what the, they're saying. They're adjusting for the people that don't meet their quotas. So it turned out to be 880,000 barrels roughly. Well, each barrel is worth either $50 or $100 a barrel, depending on which formulas you use. So the market is supported. Where is it stuck? What, what average is that? That's a 200-day average. When you come back to it, I often tell you that's going to be your resistance point. you got three layers of resistance. 93.41, 93.81, the Bollinger Band, and the 100 at 97.32. There's certainly nothing bearish on this chart. Let's start with that. But you are overbought. You've used the information up, but I doubt you're going back down here. I don't see how that happens unless world economies just collapse. This is a lot off the market. Now, to counter it, the White House said they're going to continue with the release of 10 million barrels from our strategic reserves. Well, that's great for a short term, but how do you fix all this problem, okay? Why don't we get to our friends in Canada, get the pipelines built, do what we have to do with them, and make North America a real great place to put energy out on the world. All right, here's your fight for the NOV WTI. It's crystal, it's right in front of you. 89.73, the 200-day average to 90.24, the Bollinger Band. And if it can clear all that, which I have my doubts about, uh, 93.43, I'm certainly not in the bear camp. 
This changes the equation. You now have, so to speak, a floor under the market of these lows unless something terrible on the demand side would happen. Yeah. In terms of the supply side, we now know the numbers. And this is a market that uh, is not supply driven. It's demand driven right now and they're altering supply to keep that demand very, very strong. Got what they're doing? In gasoline, well, this is just gonna increase the price of gasoline, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of these production cuts worldwide. We, keep in the back of your mind in America, it's nice to think we're energy independent. None of our refineries run alone on our oil. They need a blend, and we buy those parts of the blend for it. That's just how it works. I'm not an expert on this. I, I, I read. That's what I've been told, and I read it over and over for years. That's why we buy certain different grades. We used to count on Venezuelan oil the most. It works beautiful in our refineries. Well, you know what happened with that plant. So you put this all together. You're trying to come up with the game. Now, I mentioned natural gas to people. And why did I mention it? I mentioned it in the metal report. Because here is a market that if you understand enhanced Bollinger Bands, an event just happened. So here is the market fully embedded, and you lose the embedded reading Wednesday. Today, where do I think the market's going? And I'm wrong. I'll give you the number. I think you will hit the 18-day average before you take out the low that you made right back here. Let's get to that low, if we could. There we go. Here we go. Before you hit 66.25. Got it? So I'm looking for the 18-day average. Where else did the market find its support? Again, the combination of the Bollinger Band 200-day. You put it together, that's my game plan, and that's what I'm looking for. You keep hearing me talk about these Bollinger Bands. You're going to see the ad right after this. Again, I want to remind you, our webinar's full. So you're not seeing me any more ads. I'm not sending out any more emails. We are oversubscribed for it, which I'm very, very pleased. And I got questions galore, spiders, stocks, everything. We're going to have a ball. 20 minutes long. I'll open it at 12.15 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. That's central time. And I'll start it at 12.30. You have a great day. Welcome. I'm Ira Rapstein, and I'm here to talk about my enhanced Bollinger Band course. Now, many of you have taken my regular charting course, and if not, you might think you know something about Bollinger Bands. As you know, Bollinger Bands are an algorithm designed to keep the market trading within it 95% of the time. And on a chart, it will offer on the top part resistance, on the bottom support, and the ideas the market will travel within them. We know that sometimes it latches onto that band, goes up or goes down. Well, how do you play with that? Can you pyramid the positions off that type of thinking? Well, I've applied all three of these into 13 different videos that teach you my concept of it. And from that concept, you're able to work with weekly charts and or daily charts. The 13 videos, each about seven minutes long. The idea here is not to put you in school forever, but to teach. Now, if you haven't tried my complete futures research, I throw that in as well. Whether you've tried this or not, I think it's worth taking a look at. I think you're going to learn something from there. That research, by the way, covers twice daily market updates for you and access to what I call window envelope numbers, which I think are very important when looking at these Bollinger Bands. The next part is a trial to our charting software so you can make your charts look the same way that I do. It's that simple. Where do you go with it and how do you get all this? It's simple. You go to our website, www.iraepstein.com. If you go to the word education, everything you need is answered there. You can also call my staff. They'll be happy to help you get set up. I'm Ira Epstein on the road to your education.